Well, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank everyone for inviting me. Um, and I was thinking, uh, you know, the, the title of my talk is Staying Outside Your Comfort Zone. And when planning this talk, I thought what would be most useful might be to, to go through some steps in my career and give you a feeling about how I made certain decisions. Because recently I wrote a piece for a magazine on advising young scientists. And in it I said, there's nothing we as scientists do on a day-to-day -day basis that's really very mission critical. We're not like doctors or even running companies or you know, where decisions you make on a day-to-day -day basis or a minute-by-minute -minute basis can have huge consequences. They really don't. If your experiment doesn't work, you can go home and start again the next day. But there are major consequences that come on certain decisions that we make. What kind of projects we do, where we go to do them, that do have fundamental consequences for us as scientists. So I thought I might go through and say, how did I make sort of different decisions in my career? How did they affect what I did? And give an example of some science that we've done to illustrate some of those points. So I'm going to give a sort of a historical background to the problems I've worked on by starting with the following question, which is, what is the biggest problem that we face today as biologists? And of course, it's the problem of complexity. Biology is almost mind-bogglingly complex. It has 30,000 genes. Each gene codes are proteins in multiple domains, hundreds of cell types, millions of body forms. How can we make sense of all this complexity? Now, one sort of great step forward we've taken as biologists in the last century has been to define biology as a multi-scale problem. So we've sort of got control of that by thinking about bridging scales. So as an example, we can think of molecules to compartments, you know, how do compartments uh, emerge from the interaction of all the molecules. We can think of how all the uh, cells, uh, organization of a cell emerges from the interaction of all the compartments, and we can think about how the formation of tissues emerges from cells. And so these are what we tend to call emergent properties. There are new properties such as a cell that emerges from the interaction of the compartments and molecules that make them up. Now, of course, there are many examples of emergent properties um, in the world. As an example, the, the sound of a beautiful orchestra emerges from the interaction of all the uh, instruments, or the, the way a bird swarm forms emerges from the interaction of the way all the birds fly. And in fact, you know, physics has um, you know, made great uh, steps forward in understanding such problems in collective behavior. So as an example, the problem of how these beautiful birds swarm form um, has sort of been solved in a way by physics, which has understood how this pattern emerges from the interaction, for instance, of all the geese in this particular case. And so if physics has been uh, great at sort of studying these emergent properties, a question that we can ask is, why has it not been better employed in studying emergent properties in cell biology? Um, and, you know, because one problem with modern cell biology that we all face is the following problem, which is we get lost in details and forget about the big picture. We're extremely reductionist, and yet biology itself is in a problem of emergent properties. So how do we get to be so reductionist, and what are we doing about it? So when I started my PhD, I was very lucky to have a great supervisor, John White, um, who sort of interact with students in just the way you should do, which is he told me, he said, Tony, the C. elegans embryo is beautiful. Just look at it and think of something to work on. And so I looked at it and followed the cell division, and I fell in love with it all the way back there in 1983. I've been working on it ever since. And I did some experiments on how you set up cell division during my PhD, but towards the end of my PhD, I began to get disillusioned with working on it because I wasn't working on any molecules at all. And I thought, what I needed to do was to learn some biochemistry. I thought I should expand my, my skill set. And I went to UCSF to work with Tim Mitchison. And there I worked on the problems of the only protein we sort of really knew at that point, actually, in a CLNs embryo, which was tubulin. And here you'll see an in vitro experiment I did at the time where we're looking at microtubules growing on a cover slip. So I also did quite a lot of work then on microtubules as, as, as a postdoc in Tim's lab before starting my own group in Heidelberg. And I went to Heidelberg because um, I wanted to work at the time actually with Eric Carcenti, who was working on aspects of you know, how xenopus extracts 
control microdial dynamics. But after I got to Heidelberg and I'd been working there for a while, I went back to read a book that I'd actually read during my PhD, which is E.B. Wilson and the Foundation of Modern Cell Biology, which he first published in 1897. Now, my father was a historian, and one of the best things he sort of ever imparted to me was this concept that you need to look at what you do in, in the context of the arc of your field. Right? Everything we do takes so long. You've got to think about, historically, where is what you do fit in the overall arc of the problem. And of course, many of you know E.B. Wilson. He was the one who basically wrote down all the sort of observations on early cell biology at the beginning of the 20th century that were very useful for later, coming on later on and following up on these problems. And even then, biologists were interested in how cells organize themselves. But the problem they had is they didn't know enough about the nature of molecules to constrain the theory. And what I realized reading this book as a young group leader was the problem still remained, right? In fact, 100 years later, I was doing roughly the same kind of experiments that people had been doing at E.B. Wilson's time, just with a slightly more sophisticated technology. Now, at the time that E.B. Wilson had been developing a sort of cell biology, um, there was sort of another strain that had been developing, which is T.H. Morgan, the development of genetics. You know, much as Darwin's insights into evolution of animal species first gave coherence to 19th century biology, Morgan's findings transformed biology into an experimental science. And that became a sort of alternative path. And amazingly enough, sort of genetics and cell biology pursued parallel paths over almost a century. And the geneticists actually coming really at the work of enzymology, the field of enzymology, started in the 60s to identify and characterize individual molecules. If you remember, I said that the time of E.B. Wilson, there weren't enough molecules to constrain the theory. They didn't know what the molecular species were. So they settled down to develop a sort of reductionist chemical viewpoint of biology. Now, it's, for you in this room, it's sort of probably hard to believe that they were so separate. But I remember very clearly David Botstein coming to give a talk when I was at UCSF. Ron was there at the time. And saying that microtubules must be important for spindles because he made a deletion in tubulin and they didn't make spindles. And Mark Kirshen was furious. You know, and, and that was, and they were called pinheads and fuzz brains. Right? The cell biology sort of fuzz brains and the geneticists sort of pinheads. And they were two different tribes of, of scientists at the time. And I was very much on the fuzz brain side of it, which was the cell biologist. But after I'd started my group, three things happened that allowed a sort of real breakthrough in high throughput genetics, which was the discovery of GFP, the discovery of RNAi, and the sequencing of the C. elegans genome. At that point, I realized I could make a, a change. I could actually get involved in high throughput genetics and try to make the catalog of genes required for the C. elegans embryo. Now, the way I made that decision was, uh, you know, I thought somewhat about it, but Tim Mitchison came to visit me and I went out for a long walk with him. I was in Heidelberg at the time, and I discussed those ideas. And we sort of agreed together that probably was the best thing to do. So then I came into my lab basically the next day, and I told everyone I wanted to shift the whole lab over to doing high throughput RNAi screening. And of course, a lot of people in the lab were rather surprised because they hadn't come to my lab to work on RNAi screening. They'd come to work on microtubule dynamics. But I think that illustrates what I think about being a successful scientist, which essentially you have to have some sort of gambling mentality to make major discoveries, right? You have to gamble and roll the dice. And so I rolled the dice to see whether high throughput RNAi screening was the way to go about doing science. Now, I could sort of, sort of talk about that statement that Ron said, is there are different kinds of scientists. You, know, you don't have to be one type or another. And Mitsuhiro Yanagida, who's a professor of yeast cell biology in Japan once put it the following way, you have to decide, are you a farmer or are you a big game hunter? Right, so you know, I'm a big game hunter in the sense that I like to go out and find big things to do. You don't have to be, but being a big game hunter and having that gambling mentality is a great way you know, to get out there and do novel things that other people aren't doing. So that in fact turned out to be successful, which is 
We did a genome-wide RNAi screen in the year 2000 for cell division genes in C. elegans, and we defined about 700 genes required for the first cell division of C. elegans. And at the time, I was quite involved in that, and I got excited about that. And, um, you know, I, we coined this term the Industrial Revolution of Genetics, right, where we'd sort of taken genetics out of the cottage industry of cloning gene by gene and industrialized it. Um, you know, when I, amazing to think that in 1992, when I sort of uh, <clears throat> just finished my PhD, roughly, just a postdoc, cloning a gene still took about three years. So you'd have one graduate student would take three years to identify a gene from mutant, and that was all they did in their PhD. Eight years later, we basically identified them all in one experiment that took about a year. And, you know, so that was, you know, a sort of major triumph at the time. I felt, and I was quite proud of myself. Um, but actually, doing that experiment was sort of a bit like, can you climb a mountain and you get over a ridge and you realize the peak is still in front of you. Because I understood at that point, after a while, that we hadn't really solved the problem that we'd all set out to solve, which was, how do you organize a cell? All I'd really done in this case was create a catalog. You know, it's the ap apotheosis of the original genetics experiment that T.H. Morgan started, where we finally sort of understood all the loci for one particular, um, one particular event. And what I understood at that time was that you know, the field of molecular biology that I'd been involved in at the time was a little bit like the classification after Linnaeus. You know, he's the one who was involved in putting all the species in order. And that required the theory of evolution by natural selection to understand complexity. And we're exactly at the same point, which is what are the molecules we know what they are, and we know how they're related to each other through bioinformatics, but we don't understand the reason for the complexity, and we don't have any overarching theories such as natural selection to put it all into place, and we needed to move beyond classification. And sort of what I understood at that time, and it's been made ever since then, I've really helped me to think about how to be a scientist, is that as scientists, we tend to be a little bit like multi-generational space voyages, where the mission gets forgotten, like Wally, right? If you saw that movie, you know, Wally comes back to Earth, but the mission of repopulating Earth has been forgotten. And so, you know, we settled down to characterize all the genes and their chemistry because we didn't know how a cell was constructed. But having the catalog, we sort of forgotten the point was the emergent properties of how they all put together to form, um, to form a, a sort of structure. And so, you know, really in a way, I thought we need to get back on mission, which is now to take these catalogs and understand how the complexity of cells and tissues emerges from all these different molecules. Now, at that point in my life, I was a group leader at EMBL. Like many of you are, I had a, a non-tenured position and I had to move on. And the EMBL system is set up to move on after nine years. And Kai Siemens, um, played a very important part of my life, came into my office. Now, Kai's a very clever psychologist. And he told me, Tony, you know, we're going to go and set up an institute in Dresden, the middle of East Germany, after the wall had come down. Now, if he said, do you want to come too? I probably would have said no, because I'm British. I wanted to go back to Cambridge. But he didn't say that. He said, we thought you probably wouldn't want to come with us. So I'm like, well, you know, you know, one never wants to turn down opportunities, and then I was trapped. And so, okay. and, and Kai, though, was a, was a great, um, is, is a great guy to work for over the years because, you know, he represents a sort of exactly the spirit of this meeting, which is commitment to young scientists. First at EMBL, where he, you know, fun, got the whole group leader program started in many ways, and now, and then in Dresden, where we set up this young investigator program. At our institute, we decided at the time to not have departments. So some of you know the Max Planck Society, tend, they tend to have very large departments with 30, 40, 50 people. And Kai told us uh, no departments. Um, and you know, it was quite a lot of uh, amusing aspects of that because of course Marino Zeriel, especially in myself, we were all very young at the time, sort of in our late 30s. And, and we've seen other Max Planck directors, you know, had cars and drivers. 
you know, so we thought we'd also get a car and a driver. And so we said to Kai, where do we get the car and the driver? And he says, Tony, this, this is the new Max Planck, you know, the socialist Max Planck. There's been no drivers, no things. And, and I, I, I'd been to visit Jan Juslein Volhardt, and she had her own bathroom and shower and toilet. And I thought, wow, that's what a Max Planck's going to be like. And Kai's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> so anyway, so we end up doing it a different way. And I, I really learned a huge amount from Kai about what it takes to run a place. And this gets a little bit back to Vijay's point, which is, you know, Dresden, I don't know how to compare it in India, but it really was really way out of the way. It was ex-communist East Germany. It wasn't the sort of place you tended to go to as a um, scientist. But there's two things I learned from that. <clears throat> First, the power of doing things together. Right? We didn't do it on our own. It was five of us went out to Dresden together to run this place. And Kai was our eminence grise, but we all worked together as a team. So do it together. Do it in teams, right? It's too hard, this business, to do it on your own. You know, build a set of people that you're keen on doing things with and do it uh, together. The second thing Kai taught me is to have a healthy disrespect for bureaucracy. Um, so when he started in Dresden, you know, there was a lot of things that were quite uh, bureaucratic in Germany at the time. As an example, there were only five-year group depositions. That was maximum. And Kai thought that wasn't enough. We needed to be nine years, which was supposedly illegal in Germany at the time. But he went to his head of administration. He said, I just want you to tell me if I'm going to go to jail. If I'm not going to go to jail, I don't care. Right? I'm just going to do it. And, um, you know, and that was a very successful strategy. Because when we were finally audited by the government, and they got very upset with us, we hadn't stolen any money, or we, had, we just used public funds to do science in a better way, we thought. And so we got a little slap on the wrist, and then we had to redo it the way we wanted. But, but Kai always put doing the best science first um, and making sure that, that that was at the heart of the, the issue. And so I think I learned a huge amount then from Kai also about the concept of mentoring young people and the concept of building a culture where science comes first. As an example, we decide to have no German communication at all in the Institute, so everything is in English, even though it's right in the middle of Germany. Now, coming back to the problem I talked about before, I was kind of lucky because when I got to Dresden, we managed to recruit two outstanding physicists, mathematicians, Joe Howard and Frank Ulicker. And I started to learn a lot about physics from them and how it could contribute to the problem I was talking about, which is emergent properties. Because what I understood from them was that you can use physics to make sense of this massive complexity in biology. One thing, textbook knowledge requires synthesis, not catalogues. Now, this is a very important point. We all would like our work to be in the textbooks, say molecular biology of the cell. But as I always say to my lab, how are we going to write down for the textbooks how a mitotic spindle is assembled? No one's interested in it being assembled in yeast this way, in Drosophila this way, in C. elegans this way. That's not, that's not a description that's useful for a textbook. The textbook has to, you have to pull out the essential aspects of spindle assembly across all species so you can describe it. And you can see the reason for that when you go to high schools, they're still learning the, the biology that I learned in, in high school because we haven't got that synthetic viewpoint of spindle assembly, which is necessary to talk about it. So that's one of the challenges. I also learned from them that biology is just a complex form of matter. So we can use physical approaches to matter to think about it. And I also understood that modern biology in the future is going to require a merger between biology and physics in the same way that molecular biology was a merger of biology and chemistry. Now, there was a problem, though, which is the following. In high school, I got very poor marks in chemistry, physics, and maths. And um, in fact, they were so poor that I couldn't go to university. Um, and I was lucky because I then decided to work as a technician for a while because I decided, well, I didn't have any ambitions to be a scientist. I wanted to build a bike shop, but I needed some money to get the bike shop started. 
So I thought I'd work as a technician to do that. But <laughs> while I was doing that, I helped out one of the professors there. And he said, you know, you're a good chap. I can see you know how to do experiments. So I'll call out the admissions tutor and you can just go in. And so I did. So, and so that's why the point running a lab is the following, which is that the most important thing you do is choose people. That's the key point, choosing good people you can work with. Nothing else really matters in the end, but having good people to work with and mentoring them properly. So how is it then you choose people? So if I take someone like me, I often think back about how would I have chosen myself at that time, given that I got bad marks in these things. And I think the essential thing that I always had as an example, I was curious. I wanted to know how things work. And that's what I've come to understand is a crucial thing about a biologist that separates you from other subjects, the more analytical subjects. So people often come to me and say, oh, I'm depressed. <sighs> These physicists are so smart. These mathematicians are so smart. Um, what is a biologist? But a biologist is a very, very special skill, right? It's someone who can move through murky data without needing all the I's to be dotted and T's crossed using instinct. And they tend to have low esteem compared to mathematicians and physicists. <laughs> so that's the sort of person I tend to look for when I'm recruiting. Of course, I want some of those smart people too. But I, you know, in terms of thinking about a good biologist, I often looking for those people who've been obviously curious in their background. Something about their background suggests they were curious about how things work, because that's what you really need to be a great biologist, at least in, in my opinion. So when you're looking and recruiting, don't just look at the grades. In fact, don't look at the grades, because most of us are smart enough to be a biologist. Try and look and see, is there something special about that person which suggests they're really interested in solving a problem? So now I want to come back and just give you a little bit of science, which illustrates how it puts some of those threads together, which is the following question, which is, how do organisms adapt to their environment? You know, if you take a fox, these two different foxes have very, very different adaptations to the environment. The, the Arctic fox has a thick fur, whereas the, the, um, <clears throat> the fox that lives in the, in the desert has heat dissipation and water retention. So, of course, as Vijay actually brought up, one of the pressing problems facing scientists today in terms of temperature is how cold-blooded animals will adapt to temperature changes. And nematodes are actually one of the most important contributors to agriculture. But surprisingly enough, we know very little about temperature adaptation. Hard to get it funded, and actually quite hard to get it published, as we're finding out. So one of the things that always interested me as a PhD student was the following thing. If you take C. elegans and you grow them at 25 degrees, you get a lot of embryos the next day. But if you grow them at 26, roughly, or at degree, they're sterile. There's incredibly abrupt change. So that's another thing that I always like to point out to people in my lab, is you know, keep an eye out for curious observations like that, and keep them in the back of your mind as something which you might want to solve one day. Because, and here you're seeing the experiment. You, know, you take a worm, I just had this redone for me by my postdoc, Mark Lever, who took a worm and put it at 26.5, and it made fertile offspring, took it at 27, no offspring. That's bizarre, right? A sharp transition like that. How could that, you know, how could that be? So I always kept that in the back of my mind. And the reason that it's sterile is because the worms grow up at 27 degrees, but they don't make any babies. They don't make any embryos. In fact, and so that's one of the reasons that they're sterile at high temperature. So in other words, the germline is extremely sensitive to the temperature. Now, the germline is actually formed by an asymmetric cell division in C. elegans, where the P cell, shown on the right, goes on to make the germline through a set of cell divisions. You end up in these two cells called Z2 and Z3. And the crucial... Um, uh, compartment that's thought to be associated with the onset of the germline is P granules. And this was, came from the discovery of Stroman Wood, actually, when I was a PhD student who had a uh, an antibody. And this is an example I always like to think of really just 
taking advantage of the situation, Susan told me that I think it was a goat. She was trying to look at different antibodies that recognize C. elegans, and she found a goat secondary antibody that stained these interesting granules. She drove out to the farm where the poor goat was and had it sacrificed at that moment to, you know, to believe that it's apparently so anyway. So then, and she discovered these, uh, these pea granules. So when I was at Woods Hole, um, I was teaching the physiology course for five years. And this is another one of the amazing things that Ron has done over the years. Not only all the iBio and this seminar, but he actually, together with Tim Mitchison, organized a physiology course where he really tried to bring biology and physics together. And one year we were there with a postdoc at my time, Cliff Brangvine. And we made a surprising observation, which is that these pea granules that seem granular are actually liquids. So we noticed they fuse like liquid drops. As an example, two of them coming together here and fusing and relaxing into one kind of structure. Here's a little guy here coming in and And we realize they turn over very fast when you photo bleach them. So here they, you photo bleach it and they recover within a few seconds. And more impressively, when we dissected the gonads out of the worm, they would drip like sort of honey off your spoon in the morning. So all of those features made us realize that pea granules were liquids. They were spheres, they wetted on surfaces, and they fused into larger drops. So this is where sort of physics began to become important because how does the concept of liquids help us think about pea granule segregation? It's the sort of question we asked at the time. Now, liquids have sort of two properties. If you put two liquids together, they'll tend to mix, you know, such as coffee and tea, right? That disgusting mixture you can make in the morning if you're a bit tired. Um, and of course they mix because of diffusion, which tends to equalize the concentration of molecules. But they have a second property, which is they can phase separate by uh, the vinegar condensing out from the oil. And so we therefore decided that pea grains were forming by phase separation of liquid drops from the cytoplasm, a demixing phenomenon. Now, the question of how that impacts um, P granule segregation, I don't have to talk about today, because luckily Shamba Saha is here at the meeting. He's giving a poster. And he has just published a paper where he's illustrated how gradients of proteins control um, the, the asymmetric phase separation of proteins. Rather, I wanted to come back to the problem and think, I'd always had this in the back of my mind, you remember, why was it that these embryos were so super sensitive to temperature that you raise it by one degree and suddenly these worms are not making the embryos? But once we discovered this phase transition phenomenon suddenly clicked into place. Because the key thing about phase transitions, they're super sensitive to conditions. And one of the things they're super sensitive to is temperature. Now, temperature is a variable that's normally used by physicists. It's not something we think about as biologists. But I began to think, is there a relationship between phase separation and this aspect of what temperature can live at? Now, here's an oil droplet experiment. I'll show that again a bit quickly. 330 degrees C, we raise the temperature to 335 degrees C, and it's all, they're all gone. So these, temp these phase separations are extremely temperature sensitive. So we thought, well, is that true for pea granules? Now, Shamba, one of the key things he'd done was to reconstitute pea granule assembly from a single protein shown here. So this is one protein labeled GFP forming a liquid drop. So now what he could do is he could look and see, is that drop sensitive to temperature? And here's the experiment. We've used the temperature, actually, where they're dissolved at high temperature. And this is PGL. Now we're going to lower the temperature, and you'll see suddenly they come out of solution. Right? Their formation is extremely temperature sensitive. And in fact, we could show you know, that it's basically a, uh, a couple of degrees 
determines where they can form and where they couldn't form. So that was in vitro. So then we went back in vivo and asked the following question. Are they also temperature sensitive in vivo? And it turns out they're exquisitely sensitive to temperature. So what we're doing, we're raising the temperature now. And when you get to about 26 degrees, they just all dissolve. So indeed, P granule formation is temperature sensitive. So then we thought, well, what can we do to start to think about, indeed, are they directly related? And we know that there's a different species of Cineropditis 30 million years apart, called Briggsii, which live at a different temperature range. So then we thought we'd ask, are these pea granules actually sensitive at different temperatures? And indeed, that's exactly what we found, is that if you take C. elegans at 18 degrees, the pea granules disappear at 26. But if you take Briggsii, they only disappear at 30 degrees. And we've actually done more experiments now to show that you can directly relate the temperature dependence of pea granule formation to the fertility of the worm. In other words, you can actually relate this global phenomenon of phase separation, emergent property, all the way up to the potential ecology of the worm. And the point I just want to make here is that these emergent properties, such as phase separation, they're real phenomena, just as real as temperature and pressure. Um, you know, we think of the, the movement of molecules but they can actually generate pressure. And in the same way we think about the interaction of all the molecules inside, say, a pea granule, um, generate this phenomenon of phase separation that you can actually study independently. So what I tried to illustrate with that sort of description of the science was how you can really, by all the different threads of my career came together to study that, right? First of all, I thought about the problem as a biologist of this problem of temperature. As a postdoc, you know, I'd learned about how proteins work, so I had a strong biochemical skills that allowed me to look at that. And then slowly I moved into physics over the years so that I was actually able to understand the phenomena I was looking at. So if I would conclude then about you know, what I think it takes to be a successful scientist, I think really there are sort of two things that are important. First, you have to step outside your comfort zone. And this is really probably the most important point I want to get across today, which is it's all too easy with the pressure of grants and teaching to stay in your comfort zone. But science is a process of lifelong learning. And you need to get out of your field and present it to others outside your field to get outside the echo chamber of what you're working on. Because here's the problem you all face. Old lads like me, maybe 10, 15 years left, we can keep on working what we want and it'll probably take us all the way through to retirement, but you're all very young and science changes extremely fast. Think about where I was when I started my PhD, when John White told me to look at our embryo. We didn't know one single gene involved in forming the embryo when I started. Now we know most of them, in, you know, and I'm not even finished with my career yet. And so things move extremely fast and it through jumps. And if you're locked into your own field, you can get, um, you can become, you know, sort of uh, uh, out of date quickly. And, and fields do die, um, and you have to be aware that they are going to die and move out of them before they die. And, and I think one of the, the most salutary lessons I ever had as a postdoc is I wanted to make an enzyme, D-amino acid oxidase. I went down to the library at UCSF, the Journal of Enzymology, full of journals, right? Hundred, you know, I think it was like 70 years of research. And you, know, you had to take the journals off, whew, blow the dust off, because that had become a dead field enzymology. And so you have to get outside, you have to present your work to others in fields and not just go to specialist meetings. Make sure your students do the same thing so that you can you know, really begin to understand in advance what are the steps you're gonna have to take in order to keep um, up to date and moving with uh, the times. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you.